Guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of A Murder to Die For by Stephen Colgan. So, a quick bit of backstory here. Basically, I already filmed this part of the review. I actually filmed the whole thing. Lost this little bit of footage. So, this is a brand new introduction to guide us into the rest of the footage that I've already shot. Now, I'm trying to remember what I actually said in this footage, but I don't think it was anything hugely exciting. A few things I did mention is kind of full disclosure here. Stephen Colgan is a local author to me. I've met him several times. He's actually spoken at a writer's workshop that I've hosted. But I did actually buy this book with my own money. I actually pledged to support it through Unbound, which is the publisher that it comes out through. And it's not actually available yet, so I have a pre-release copy because, again, I, I pledge my support to help make this book ha happen. And actually what's interesting is at the end, it has a list of all the people who've pledged to support this book. And there are people like Jimmy Carr and Sandy Toxvig and stuff who are kind of famous people. And then there are other people who are my friends from here in Wickham, which is cool as well. Just to give you a bit of context, Stephen Colgan works as an elf on QI, the TV show. So basically he's a researcher for that show. He used to be a policeman before he went into writing full time and doing that as his gig. He's written a number of non-fiction books, but this one here is his first full length novel as far as I'm aware. And again, it's blurred by Sandy Toxvig and Stephen Fry. And uh, yeah, we're going to take a look at it. But first, let me read you the blurb. When hordes of people descend on the picturesque village of Naisley for the annual celebration of its most famous resident, murder mystery writer Agnes Crabb, events take a dark turn as the festival opens with a shocking death. Each year the residents are outnumbered by crowds dressed as Crabb's best known character, the lady detective Millicent Cutter. The weekend is never a mild-mannered affair as fan club rivalries bubble below the surface, but tensions reach new heights when a second crab devotee is found murdered. Though the police are quick to arrive on the scene, the facts are tricky to ascertain as the witnesses, suspects and victim are all dressed as Miss Cutter, and they want to solve the crime too. So without further ado, let's take a look at what I thought of the book. Come on, Pastain, where are you? So just a few general thoughts on this before I go into it. One of the things I was really impressed with was how this fuses both the comedy and the satirical element of it, and actually just a good old-fashioned cosy murder mystery. I think with most books like this that I've seen, where people have tried to blend the two of them, they've failed. They've either got the comedy right but not the mystery, or they've got the mystery right but not the comedy. And Colgan very much achieves both. And he also, you can tell he's had fun while he's while he's gone through and written it as well. I think the characters are very believable, um, very three-dimensional characters. And it just satirises so many different elements of modern life, including one of the big ones is the, the whole sort of fanboy and fangirl elements. So when they have this, this big event, which the whole book is about the Agnes Crab Festival in the village of Naisley, and... To the point where everyone's kind of cosplaying, they're all competing, saying, oh no, I'm a bigger fan than you are, and there are all these tensions again. And I think it's, considering Agnes Crabb is a fictional writer, I think he's done great at actually making it feel as though there really are these Agnes Crabb fanboys and fangirls around. I mean, like, there are guys going around dressed as Millicent Cutter as the uh, heroine of, of her books as well. To begin with, as I mentioned, Agnes Crabb is a fictional writer, however... That's kind of offset by, before you really get in, there's a kind of an introductory essay almost on Agnes Crabb and it gives you a brief biography of her. It also gives you a list of her releases, including things like when there are um, lost manuscripts and that kind of stuff. And that's really good attention to detail, I feel. Colgan's not only thought about just some titles to give this character some background, he's actually thought about the context of when each of these fictional books were written, what the plots were, and then actually play a part in the plot of this book as well. There's also a cool concept because Agnes Crabb, the fictional detective writer, basically the, the setup is, is that she wrote all of these books during her lifetime and they were never published and she left them in the possession of kind of a solicitors on the instruction that they be opened a certain point after her death. And they opened all these manuscripts and they went on sale and they quickly became bestsellers and that's where all this fandom came about. And I thought that was a great little backstory and he actually explains at the end that it is based on a true case, although I believe it was with an artist rather than with a writer. So there's a character in here as well called Shunter who is an ex-copper and um, basically he used to work for the Metropolitan Police Force it says During his 30 year career with the Met in London he'd been insulted and screamed at more times than he could remember and had grown a skin as thick and impenetrable as an armadillo's 
Now, Colgan himself used to be a policeman as well, so I think it's great how he's kind of put that into the character, and it really works. It makes this character feel more believable. The ex-cop almost feels more believable than the actual current-day cop, and it's, again, the current-day cop, he's just awful at his job, and he keeps making these bad decisions because he wants to be in the limelight, and he gets in the limelight, but for all the wrong reasons. There are also some fantastic names in this, so if you think that this is obviously a take on the classic detective novel, Colgan's really lived up to that in terms of the names that are used. So, you know, Miss Marple, for example, she used to live in St. Mary's Mead, and it's a delightfully quaint British place name, and he does that with place names, character names, the whole lot. So, for example, there is a Miss Brenda Tredescent of the Millicent Cutter Appreciation Society, and there's a book called Love's Moist Promise by Simone Bedhead. Mrs. Handybode. I think all of the names are just great, and the place names as well. Obviously, this all takes place in the village of Naisley, which is... It does sound like a British place name. I also found it interesting, there's, there's actually a lot of stuff in here that, that makes you learn things. So they're talking about libel and slander. So someone says, you can't libel the dead. Any fool knows that. It would be slander. I never knew that dis difference, and now I've learned that from reading this book, even though this isn't one of Colgan's non-fiction books. There's some great characterization as well. So this is the cop who is bad at his job. So let me just read a little bit of an excerpt. And I just think it's great little details like this that kind of underscore his personality and make you realize, yes, he really is bad at his job. <laughs> Detective Inspector Brian Blunt stared at his computer screen and tried to remember whether it was stationary, with an A, or stationary, with an E, that he had to type if he wanted to order some headed notepaper from police stores. The spell checker offered no hope at all. Just like him, it could spell both words correctly, but it was annoyingly vague regarding their proper use. Blunt had a similar blind spot for the words effect and effect, and no matter how many times he learned the difference, the information never seemed to stick. Resignedly, he looked up the answer in an online dictionary. He couldn't ask his staff. That would mean admitting that he didn't know something that they probably did, and that would never do. Some of the action scenes where the armed police are going in to try and apprehend fugitives, it borders on the farcical. Like, you know, like, or like really, it's almost like, it's almost slapstick, but it works, especially in the context of this book. It wouldn't work if the rest of the book wasn't done in the way that it is. There's one guy as well, this guy called Savage, who starts off by running a burger van and basically his burger van gets destroyed at the at the hands of a mob of people dressed as Millicent Cutter, this fictional detective. And he basically has a mental breakdown. And when he has this breakdown, it almost felt Stephen King-esque. So King has a way with bad guys of making bad guys that are almost a victim of circumstances. You know, something really bad has happened to these people, and because of that, that makes them lose their marbles a bit, and they do things that they would never normally do. And that very much is what happens to Savage as well, who is... He's kind of painted as a bad guy, but he's he's a bad guy you love to hate. I think he was one of my favourite characters, just because he was so unhinged. There is also plenty of references to classical literature in here as well, so there's a great one to Agatha Christie. So, somebody gets poisoned, they get poisoned by Taxine, I believe, and somebody says, After all, this is a murder mystery festival, and Agatha Christie used Taxine in a pocket full of rye. She put it in some bloke's marmalade. I also think here there are some great influences that uh, Colgan himself probably thought of. So he says, The stars of the golden age of murder mystery shone down on him. Agatha Christie, G.K. Chesterton, Ronald Knox, Marjorie Allingham, Michael Inns, Dorothy L. Sayers, and Guy O'Marsh and Josephine Tay among them. The Sherlock Holmes books of Conan Doyle were there too. And one entire bookcase was taken up with Agnes Crabbe books and DVDs. I think a lot of the bits in this as well, it's satirical, but it's also very true. Like... It could cut you, is how sharp it is, some of these things. So there's this actress who plays Millicent Cutter in the TV adaptations, and she says, um, You can't beat the clock. All those thousands of pounds on lifts and tweaks and tucks and plumps, and all I look is four years younger than I actually am. Fuck you, Father Time. There are thousands of 20-something wannabes out there with perfect hair and straight white teeth and perky breasts, all waiting for the day that some casting director says, too dowdy to me. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. And it's so bloody frustrating as I'm a better actor now than I've ever been. I just want a fucking BAFTA. Age doesn't matter, said Savage. Maybe not to a doctor or a pilot or a chef, but it matters to actresses. Age is our biggest enemy. Helen Mirren, Judy Dench, they do alright. 
Yes, but they are wise and magnificent and glamorous, said Greeley. There are loads of roles for mature women like that. But you try to find decent roles for the slightly over the hill pushing 40 actress like me. As soon as you leave your 30s, your parts dry up. Oh, ha, I could have phrased that better, couldn't I? Ha! The point is that decent roles are as rare as hen's teeth. Too old to get the sexy roles, too young to play the matriarch. I'm sliding towards that pit of despair, my wilderness years, playing host in some godforsaken gastro pub in the Cotswolds, or fucking commercials. Oh god, I could end up as the mum in some perfect nuclear family advertising cooking the fucking bag chicken. Another great thing that made me laugh as well, the uh, policeman in this, he listens to podcasts, except they're not called podcasts because they're police procedural podcasts. They're called plodcasts. There's also a great bit when they're after this, but they're after a suspect and uh, these travellers help him because they saw him run down a duck and they're getting really angry about a duck killer. <laughs> As Shuntner drove off, she took a deep drag on her e-pipe. Go get that duck killing bastard, she growled and returned to her crochet. I think what he's done really well here is actually brought the cosy detective story into the 21st century as well, what with things like references to podcasts and plenty of pop culture references, but he kind of intermingles that with his own entire, you know, the entire canon of Agnes Crabb, this fictional detective, and he manages to kind of go from Agnes Crabb references to references to our own culture, and not only does it work really well for you as a reader, but it actually adds some extra legitimacy to Agnes Crabb and her fictional repertoire as well. There's also some great meta bits where Colgan refers to the kind of the golden rules of writing a murder mystery, but he refers to them and specifically then breaks them as well. And he talks about that in his outro essay as well. One final thing I did really like about the ending as well is that this hardcore fan of Agnes Crabb switches her affections to Ngaio Marsh as well. And my, my uncle's a big fan of Ngaio Marsh. They're all kind of referred to as the crime queens. There are a bunch of different authors. So one thing I did mention is there is kind of a closing essay to this as well, but it's definitely worth reading because it gives you a lot of context into how this story developed. So one of the things is that Mr. Colgan dedicates the book and actually uses part of the work of his father. And so his father's called Michael Colgan and he unfortunately passed away of a heart attack not long after retiring. So he didn't get to finish his, his manuscript. So Stephen uses parts of that to you know reference to Agnes Crabb's work and I think that was really touching. One other thing that he does as well, I'm going to read this out to you just as my final parting thing from this book. So I found myself hiding the titles of 10 Agatha Christie novels throughout the book. They all take the form of anagrams and they're all proper names. So for example, I might have hidden The Pale Horse as the name Peter Holyish, or Absent in the Spring as Tessa Perth Binning, or I could have turned Giant's Bread into a place name like East Braiding. As it happens, I didn't use any of those in the book, but I did use 10 others. Good luck finding them all. And I think that's a perfect little finishing touch because then that immediately makes this re-readable because you could go back through it again and try and look for them all. Obviously, I've given that a shout out here, so now you know to look for it. So as you can probably guess from the way I've talked about it, it's a five out of five stars for me. Love this book, heartily recommend it, and you should go and read it. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment to let me know what you think of this book, whether you're going to be reading it, if you can get your hands on a copy. And in the meantime, please do subscribe for more bookish videos. And I'll see you in another one soon. Thanks. Bye.